part of prison life come out, th that inside and outside, you know, we really are in prison in all kinds of ways. Um, I wanted to just follow up Nikki's point about the, there have been hunger strikes in the women detention centers, and there are women here from the All Africa Women's Group. Uh, some of their members have been inside and have been part of those hunger strikes. And we're going to hear from one, one of the women now. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. I'm a member of the All African Women's Group, which is a self-help group. We are asylum seekers and refugees and uh, migrants from all over the world. Uh, we are not only just from Africa, we have women who come from everywhere, right about everywhere. Um, it was good to hear Salma talking about the, um, the van. I'm sure you've seen it on TV or you've seen it on in the newspaper, which is say, you better leave now or we'll come after you. And I think that's racial profiling because at the end of the day, it's, um, it's targeting people from Africa and Asia because you, we are non-EU, therefore we don't qualify to be here. And they are making it even harder for people to renew their visas. And they're also making it harder for asylum seekers to be granted leave to remain. Because they know very well that they Asylum seekers, when they come here, they are fleeing persecution, but in, in return, we are being sentenced to life in prison, whereby we, we are just staying out here. You are not allowed to work, you are not allowed to, to, to study, and sometimes they call you for an interview, you go to the reporting centers, and they take you in, and you have to fight your way through the women's groups for you to be able to come out. And when you come out, they put a tag on you so that they can monitor you. Some of our women could have been here, but they are not able to be here because they've got to be indoors by three o'clock. Therefore, they are being their movement is being restricted. And uh, was it yesterday, Boris Johnson was on the news saying that trying to defend his own government. And yet, um, when he was campaigning to be a mayor for London, against Ken Livingstone, he said we should give uh, uh, immigrants the right to stay like amnesty and he has forgotten about that and a few weeks ago when he said he wants to rerun in the next mayoral election he said we should also consider giving amnesty so I don't know how many how many amnesties John Boris Johnson has spoken about the same thing goes for Nick Lake in 2010 he was campaigning that we should regularize all immigrants so that they can pay tax and nothing has ever been done. When he talks now, he says, no, we are in coalition. We have to compromise. So that means everything has been abandoned. So whenever they are campaigning, don't ever listen to what they say, because you know very well they won't deliver. So I remember one of my colleagues, she's here. She, call, she, said, she called me. She sent me a message to say, oh, the, Boris Johnson just says it. I said, don't ever be fooled. This is the second time he has done it. And you con they, con they still continue to do that. And right now, because they are scared of UKIP, they are now saying, because what is happening, the minute you mention taxpayers' money, it makes the British people happy and very comfortable. That also, because like yesterday, they were saying uh, on press review that um, it take, it's, we spent 15,000 pounds to deport uh, an immigrant. So that's scaremongering, so that there are people who believe that, oh, they're spending a lot of money and who could use that money for other things in this country. And then those people there, if they were not making it tougher for them, they will be able to, to regularize their stay and being able to stay, and some of them can actually go and work. But at the moment, I'm sure in, in early next year, you're gonna see it when Romania and Bulgaria comes in, it's gonna be like, Oh, you see that one there? They are not supposed to be here. And that means, you know, we are being racial profiled. And some of us women from the All African Women's Group, we have had the opportunity to attend uh, the Jim Mubenga inquest. Right from the first day or the second day, you could actually tell that the G4S uh, security guards were guilty of killing Jimmy. Uh, because Jimmy had the right to be here, he was a refugee. He was a loving father of five children and a wife but they still had the opportunity to deport him, although he wasn't supposed to have been deported. 
They killed him as they were trying to send him home. He was calling out saying, they'll kill me, they'll kill me. And he shouted for help to say, they're killing me here, they're killing me. And the chief of security guards, they were giving the impression even to the flight attendants and to the passengers that he was faking um, a heart attack. So nobody could actually come closer. And uh, there's one man who signed in the inquest. He's gonna be traumatized for the rest of his life. For the, of course, he feels that he contributed to Jimmy's death by not helping. And we do know of another guy called Olu who tried at one point when he was on a, aboard a plane and they were trying to deport somebody. And when he went to say, you know, what are you doing? They arrested him, they took his money because he was going to attend a, a family wedding. And recently he had to fight his way and he just got his money back and they just, you know, won his... Uh, his case. So when people hear such issues, then they will think, oh, what's going to happen to me? So in the end, people won't, won't get involved. And also for Trayvon Martin, I'm sure um, it's been quite interesting after the verdict that uh, the, ju the members of the jury have been coming out publicly speaking that uh, uh, Judge Zimmerman got away with murder. That they are saying that we only had to follow the law. If not because of the law, they could have found him guilty. And also, you could see when the verdict was read, he showed no emotion. That shows he doesn't feel anything. To him, killing Trevor, Trevor Martin was like killing a chicken. It didn't mean anything. And um, also, the fact that he lied in so many ways. When he called 911, they told him not to follow Trevor Martin. They asked him, is he black or white? Why were they asking him, is he black or white? You ask yourself. So that means if he's black, that means he's a guilty boy. And that boy only had candy, which is sweet here. You know, and uh, what I think is, if it can happen to Trevor, it can happen to you, it can happen to your son, it can happen to any one of us. And which is the same thing that happened to Jimmy Mubenga. If it can happen to Jimmy, it can happen to you. And it's the same thing that happened to Stephen Lawrence. That's why you see that um, they were trying even to find, to dig out dirty from the family, to say, can you have a book whereby you write, the, you record everyone who visits your family? I mean, how on earth can you have a, a book that you write who visits, who visits your house, and then you hand it over to the police? Shame on you. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh. Yes, okay, that, that was great, thank you, that covered so many issues and I, I think that one of the things that we were having to face up to is that often the movement here has not wanted to listen to refugees and asylum seekers, especially women, you know, have been very invisible in the movement and have even been, you know, refused fares and turned away from movement events, which is an absolute scandal and which we have to absolutely put a stop to, you know, if we're serious about getting together and making this movement happen. So thanks again, uh, that, that was very important what you said. I, I see that a sister, uh, Stephanie, has arrived and I, maybe in a little bit you'll want to say something about the fight that you're making, because I think this, that is something that people should hear about. Hi, my name's Anne. I'm from Queer Strike, and we've got a placard there which says Bradley Manning is our queer whistleblower hero. And he's our queer whistleblower hero not only because he came out as gay, which he did, which was very courageous in, in itself, knowing the likely, even harsher treatment he was likely to get from the military, but he came out and told the truth. He told the truth about the military industrial complex and what was happening and gave huge power to people everywhere from Afghanistan to Haiti, from Iraq to the Congo. And that's why he's our hero. But he's also our hero because in coming out, he, he's, his coming out and the fight to defend him has really been a cutting edge in the queer movement about whether we, about whether the movement is in favor of gays being in the military and sees gays being in the military as a victory, or whether the movement is really saying there's no pride in the slaughter of others. Yay. And being in the military is not what we have fought for for 40, 50, 60 years. So we, 
and the, the movement, this, the time is now that the movement is going to have to decide which side it's on. Is it about, you know, having, being able to be gay and be the president of Citibank or be gay and be the head of some big corporation, some other big corporation? Or is it about that this is a movement for liberation and justice for all of us? And Bradley Manning faces, as you know, I'm sure, 136 years in prison. And the, the movement needs to, you know, carry, is determined to carry on until he is free and all the prisoners are free. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, would anyone else like to speak? Yeah. Oh, Andrew. I'll hold your bag, Andrew.